Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 148. This is the first episode of 2013, and there certainly is a lot already going on this year. So this episode is packed with the genealogy news, your emails, and of course, we got lots of gems tucked in along the way. First up in the genealogy news, you know, one of the longest running and best known websites is Cindy's List at cindyslist.com. The website is run by Cindy Howells, and for over 16 years, she has meticulously cataloged all the websites that are devoted to genealogy, at least all the ones she could put her hands on. Anyone can go to cindyslist.com for free and follow the topic links to find online resources on just about any area of genealogy. Now, I've mentioned Cindy's List several times here on the podcast, and I've been honored to have the Genealogy Gems website and podcast, of course, listed on her site. Well, back on November 1st of 2012, Cindy posted an article on Facebook, and she described how she had discovered that another website had copied her entire website, not just a few links, but literally the entire website is what she said, and that they made it available on their website. Now, over the years, I found some of my podcast episodes and videos that I make available for free, you know, posted on other websites. But I've never encountered someone copying a large chunk or or my entire website. I don't worry too much about it. Because typically, the sites that do that are what I call spam sites. These are sites that aren't obviously tied to known genealogy companies, but rather they're a site just trying to randomly post content to get people to uh, come to their website through Google searches so they could make a few bucks from the ads that they have on their site. However, Cindy's case is quite different. According to justia.com, a site that makes available public information on dockets and lawsuit filings, Cindy's List and Cynthia Howells has formally filed a lawsuit against the alleged content snatching website. But the real shocker is that the website in question isn't some random spam website, but rather it was one that was launched last year in 2012 by an established genealogist, Barry Yule. The site is called MyGenShare, and in addition to free content, Barry offers paid membership for access to all of the content. Now, it's hard to imagine under what circumstances it would seem reasonable to copy somebody else's entire website. As a genealogy content creator and website owner myself, I know the long, long hours and the money that's required to make a site like that happen. Because there is an active lawsuit, of course, the folks involved can't really talk about it, so we don't have a lot more information. But this situation is an excellent reminder on a couple of fronts just for us as genealogists. First, copyright infringement is really a serious and it's a real issue and it's not to be taken lightly. Just because we find something online and public doesn't mean necessarily that it's free for the taking. And this is something that genealogists are confronted with on a regular basis, you know, from finding family photographs to family trees that are posted online. It's important to ask permission and give proper credit where credit is due. And secondly, there's no place to hide anymore. You know, with social media, this story of copyright infringement revolving around Cindy'sList.com has absolutely blazed across the social media websites out there like wildfire. These actions could possibly literally bring my gen share to a screeching halt practically overnight, regardless of the final outcome of the case. And if proven true in a court of law, then rightly so. But it's a strong reminder that the court of public opinion doesn't wait for trial dates. Our online activities really aren't just conducting the privacy of our own homes, and behaving honorably in private is really just as important as doing it in public. I'll be following this story 
I'll let you know when I learn more, but I'm interested to hear what you think about this. Have you experienced a situation where someone copied a large portion of your genealogical work? And how do you handle situations where you find items online that you'd like to incorporate into your own research? Have you approached the original owner and asked permission? And if you're blogging about your family history, have any of your readers asked you for permission to reprint or otherwise use some of the content that you've made available online? I'd love to hear from you. So drop me a line, genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or you can leave a voicemail at 925-272-4021. might play it here on the show and have an ongoing conversation about this really important topic. Now, if you have a copy of my newest book, Turn Your iPad Into a Genealogy Powerhouse, then you are one of the first to get a peek at the new Roots Magic mobile app. Well, the good news is that the free app for iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch is now officially launched, and it's available in the iTunes App Store. And according to Michael Booth, who's the vice president at Roots Magic, A version of the app for Android devices will be available in the near future, so keep an eye out for that. Now, while the app doesn't give you full functionality of the Roots Magic software, it's not going to be the entire software program, it does put your family tree information at your fingertips on your mobile devices and provides a lot of useful features, uh, including accessing your actual Roots Magic files via iTunes or, or Dropbox. So there's no conversion needed, and that's really good news. You can copy as many files as you want right on your device via iTunes or Dropbox. And users of other genealogy software programs like PATH, Family Tree Maker, Legacy Family Tree, and others, they can convert their files into viewable RootsMagic files using the free desktop software. And that means, of course, they're viewable in the app. It also allows you to easily search and explore your family tree. Familiar pedigree, family, descendant, and individual views help you quickly explore your family tree when you're on the go. And you can also search for specific people by name or record number. You can also view pictures, notes, and sources. And you can browse lists of your information and view more information about sources, to-do items, your research logs, media addresses, repositories, correspondences, and places. There are also some useful tools to assist you in your research, including there's a perpetual calendar, a date calculator, uh, they've got a a relationship calculator there, and the Soundex calculator. So the Roots Magic for iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch, it's free. It's now available in the Apple Store. It does require the Roots Magic desktop family tree software or the free Roots Magic Essential software in order to create, edit, or add to your genealogy files. So this is really a viewing tool for you on your mobile device. And you can learn more about it at rootsmagic.com slash iOS or do a quick search on Roots Magic in the iTunes App Store. And also new in 2013 is the Southern California Genealogical Society's popular Jamboree Extension webinar series. It's here again. If you are looking to brush up on genealogy research or learn some new skills from the comfort of your own home, then these webinars are definitely for you. The Jamboree Extension series webinars are conducted on the first Saturday and the third Wednesday of each month. So mark your calendars. Saturday sessions will be held at 10 a.m. Pacific, which is 1 p.m. Eastern. Wednesday sessions will be scheduled at 6 p.m. Pacific, and that's 9 p.m. Eastern time. For more information or if you want to register for one of the 2013 sessions, check out the Southern California Genealogical Society website. Go directly to scgs.genealogy.com slash extension dash series slash jes2013.html. It's a long one. I've got it for you in the show notes. And the initial live webcast of all of these classes, those are free. You can um, register, as I said, attend the live webinar session. It's open to the public. And then the recording of the webinar classes are available to SCGS paid members exclusively on the SCGS website. To give you an idea of what's coming up here in the next few months on Wednesday, January 16th, 6 p.m. 
Pacific Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Linda Geiger Woodward is presenting documentation. Never having to ask, where did that come from? That sounds like an important one. On Saturday, February 2nd, at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern, Eric Bazier is doing digital organization for documents and photographs. On Wednesday, February 20th of 2013, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, Michael John Neal. He's going to be doing No Will, No Problem. And yours truly, Saturday, March 2nd, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. I hope that you will join me. I will be doing a brand new presentation. It's called Time Travel with Google Earth. And of course, I will have a link in the show notes for this episode number 148 to uh, all of that information. And you can check it out on the SCGS website. Hope you'll register. Would love to see you in class live. And speaking of uh, conferences, you know, SCGS is well known for its genealogy jamboree each year in June. And there are two more national conferences that have gotten together and they are merging to create a larger family history event. Now, most genealogists firmly believe that genealogy is more than just collecting name and dates. And to their delight, the organizers of the popular Roots Tech Conference reinforced that belief by adding the Story at Home Conference to the lineup at Roots Tech 2013. And that's going to be held in Salt Lake City, Utah, March 21st through the 23rd of 2013. And I am looking forward to it. I'll be there uh, both in the exhibit hall conducting uh, interviews in the media area, and of course, teaching several classes. According to the recent press release, it says with the addition of the Story at Home conference, Ritz Tech now provides a rich conference experience for anyone interested in learning how to preserve and share their personal and family stories. Story at Home presenters include nationally renowned storytelling experts, including Sid Lieberman and Kim Whitecamp. It's, again, going to be held March 21st through the 23rd. And the Story at Home section of the conference is going to help bring family histories to life through the power of story. We talk about that so often here on the podcast about how critical that is. They're going to have over 20 classes that offer insight into how to successfully research, tell, record, publish, and then share family stories. And if you are already registered for Roots Tech, guess what? Story at Home is automatically included in the full conference pass, including three-day, one-day, and student passes. And that is great news. Now, if you're registered for the Getting Started track at Roots Tech, you can add the Story at Home classes for just $40 more. You just edit your registration. So I will have a link to one of my recent blog posts with all the information for you in the show notes. And from genealogy conferences to genealogy online digitized records, FamilySearch has added an additional 6.4 million new free index records and images to their website. Notable additions include the 1,034,803 records for the Netherlands, Zeeland Province, church records from 1527 to 1907, Uh, Also, nearly 1.5 million added from Italy civil registrations from 1824 to 1941. 1,069,000 added to the new Saskatchewan Canada collection from 1846 to 1957. I'm going to be digging in that one. Other new searchable collections online were added also for Canada, Germany, Italy, as I said, New Zealand and Peru. And of course, the U.S. Um, I will have a link to my recent blog post on this. And there's a complete chart there so that you can really kind of go through and see, are there any record collections that you've been waiting for that stand out in the list? And then that'll link you over to FamilySearch.org. And another website adding lots of new records to their website is FindMyPast.com. 40 million new genealogy records to help you locate your family history. In December, findmypast.com released new and exclusive historical records that highlight significant life events of the past. According to the company, more than 40 million new records are included. Um, I did a recent blog post on this. It's called 40 million new genealogy records to help you locate your family history. It has all the details there. Um, You'll find records from the UK court and probate, 
uh, education and work, and military records. And there's also new records um, for the U.S. for military records, lots of the various wars, as well as uh, birth. And let's see here, they've got birth, death, and marriage out of Kentucky and Texas. Also records for Australia and Ireland. So it's not just exclusively the U.K., but you will find them for around the world. And again, I'll have a link to that in the show notes. And here's another little interesting item that I wrote about the other day on the website. Um, There was a big birthday celebrated on January 1st. It wasn't just the birth of a new year, but it was um, the celebration of a birthday that changed your life forever. 30 years ago, on January 1st, 2013, the Internet was born. The impact of the creation of the Internet is really difficult to fully comprehend. But, you know, for genealogists, it's certainly been a boon. You know, there's family history message boards. Those came out early on. And then we got into genealogical digitized record websites. And, of course, even genealogy podcasts. Well, a gentleman named Vint Cerf was one of the three men who shaped the Internet's architecture way back in the 1980s, including co-designing what was called the TCP slash IP protocol. Ah, you'll recognize IP, won't you? (laughs) And in a recent article at Google's official blog, Vint Cerf provides a behind-the-scenes look at January 1st, 1983, when the TCP slash IP transition occurred. And that was truly the underpinnings of the Internet that came into existence that we know today. So um, check that out over at the Genealogy Gems News blog, and I'll have a link that takes you directly to it. It really is hard to imagine anybody whose life hasn't in some way been impacted by the Internet. Um, It's a fascinating read. Go check it out over at the official Google blog. Okay, well, coming up next, we're going to hear from you. We'll be doing that over at the mailbox. Everybody was busy over the holidays. Many of you took a few minutes out to uh, drop me a line. I always appreciate that. Lenora wrote in to say, I listened to your virtual Christmas party episode where you asked each person what they're doing genealogically for Christmas. Though I've done several fun projects over the years, this year I didn't do anything except host the whole group for Christmas. Three daughters and spouses and six grandchildren with two of their POSLQs. But one of our daughters created a very special book of our family's past Christmases. We lived overseas for many years, so each country has its own couple of pages with photos of our holiday celebrations there. What a trip and a wonderful gift. Oh, that's a neat idea. Love that. And Jean wrote in to say, I enjoyed listening to everyone you talked to during your virtual trip around the world in episode 147. However, I must say what I enjoyed most was listening to Davey as he explored your home and the Christmas decorations. Of course, she's talking about my lovely little grandson, Davey. She says, I loved listening to the young voice so filled with excitement and enthusiasm for everything he found. My grandchildren are growing up too quickly and I miss that toddler age. 
They still help their poppy and grandma enjoy Christmas through their eyes, but at 5, 8, and 11, it is different than watching and listening to a little one. Well, thank you, Jean. I appreciate it. I I know. I just try to soak it in. That's why I've been recording everything, (laughs) because they do. They grow up so quickly, but wow, it's really re-energized Christmas for us around here having uh, little ones in the house. I agree with you. And Cindy wrote in, she has a question about place names. And I think some of you may identify with this. She says, I'm trying to clean up my place names in my database. And I came across some that are before a state became a state. And even some before we even became a country. South Dakota is the state that I'm working on right now. If the dates I have for, let's say, an ancestor's birth are before statehood, shouldn't they read Elk Point, comma, Union, comma, Dakota Territory, comma, USA? And the ones before we were a country, how should they read? I have an ancestor who died in 1704, and my tree reads Worcester, Massachusetts, USA. Or should I be naming places for what they are now? I think it should be the same name the place was at the time of the event, but I seem to be the only one. Well, Cindy, there are arguments on both sides. After I did a quick Google search, I found several writings on the subject in support really of both methods, using the modern location and using the location at the time of the event. So I'll have links in the show notes to you for those. Personally, I use the location name at the time of the event. My logic is that, you know, many times I have to do a lot of work to determine the name of a location at the time of the event. Uh, A German village is the perfect example. It's now technically in Poland, um, but there's a very, you know, unique German name for the way it was at that time. And it would be really easy to lose that precious name that I found if I'm focusing in my tree with the current Polish name. And besides, you know, when I'm looking for records, I'm not necessarily looking for the current modern day Polish name, am I? I'm looking for the village in the original German name, because that's when the records were created. Now, another consideration is that place names can change. They can continue to change. So if you use modern day names, you know, aren't they really just accurate the day you entered them? Uh, We've seen it time and time again, you know, that our kids don't even know what the USSR is, you know, because it's not that anymore. So those names change. So I think if we think about modern day names, it's almost, dare I say, I think it's kind of selfish, because it's really focused on us at this moment in time. Um, What the way I kind of play it safe is I often include the modern day name in parentheses, after the name of the place at the time of the event. Um, And that way, I've got them both, just to be safe. And sometimes, you know, you will be going to search in a particular archive, and you'll find that they are categorizing things by modern day names, which I still think would be kind of a challenge, but that can happen. And so you need to be able to know both and be able to access them quickly to be able to find the records you're looking for. Um, And of course, with everything else in genealogy, one of the most important things to a question like this is consistency. Whatever you do, be consistent, and that's going to make your life a lot easier. I hope that helps you out. And I got an email from two brand new genealogy bloggers. The first one is Vicki Long, and she says, I've been listening to your podcast for months, and I'm almost caught up to the current one. Tonight, I took the plunge, and with the help of my dear husband, I started a genealogy blog. It's called Turn the Hearts. And it's at turntheheartsweebly.com. Thanks for your encouragement. And I wanted to let you know, and Vicki, I left you a comment on your blog. When I went to turntheheartsweebly.com, the home page is blank. But there was a secondary page underneath of it. If you clicked on the column on the left, you could get to your blog post. So I think you might have an extra layer of uh, hierarchy, if you will, of your blog which means when a reader goes to that initial website address, they're going to get that blank page. I'm going to have a link that will take you directly to the page that I found that had all of her blog posts there. It's turntheheartsweeblycom slash turntheheartshtml. And Jackie in Australia also has a new blog. She writes, 
Uh, I'm very excited to continue learning and adding to my blog. You have inspired me to do this, and I'm having lots of fun. Some of my family are keen for me to keep doing this. My blog spot is only a baby at the moment. I'll give you the address, but please remember it's only just been conceived. It's RaymondDodd.blogspot.com. Well, congratulations to you both for putting your family history out there. And I wish you, of course, great success. Hopefully, even you'll uh, come up with a few new cousin connections. And um, I I encourage all of you to go out and uh, take a visit, leave a comment, encourage these new bloggers out there to to keep it going. And if you want to learn more, maybe about how to uh, do your own family history blogging, go to the YouTube Genealogy Gems channel. And the good news is I finally put a page to it on the website. So if you go to genealogygems.com and uh, hover your mouse over videos, the drop-down menu will give you, there's a tab there that takes you directly to the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. I've got um, a, a series of videos there that are free to watch that you can follow along and create your own blog on Blogspot. Okay, well... I've got several other gems here, so we're just going to kind of do, get into kind of quick gem mode. What do you think? And uh, touch on a couple of interesting items. That's coming up next. Great news for all you genealogists out there. Roots Magic 6 is now available and it offers some of the most customer requested features like online publishing, the ability to search every record, not just people, an editable timeline view, which is really incredible, and new web tags, which lets you link people, sources, places, and research log items to web pages. Plus, dozens of other great enhancements, and of course, all the built-in features that you've come to enjoy. There is a little something here for everyone. Now, if you're already a devoted Roots Magic user like I am, or if you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and finally start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've just been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, there's no better time to get your copy of Roots Magic 6. Do it now. Go to RootsMagic.com and download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 6. You'll see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at RootsMagic.com. Jim, I'm going to give you five reasons that you need the new YouTube app for your family history. There is a new YouTube app for the iPad. It's also available for iPhone and Android, and it's a must-have for your favorite mobile device. It's been a long time coming, but it really is worth the wait. So here's a list of the features that you can enjoy with this new free app. They've got improved search. So there's new tools, including auto-suggestion and the ability to browse for new videos while you watch, which is kind of nice. Faster loading of videos. Of course, we like faster. They've got more ways to share great video finds. So if you find a video that you like, you can share it really easily on Google+, on Facebook, Twitter. You can email it. 
or you can text message it right from the YouTube app. It's got a new sleek design as well. The YouTube channel guide allows you to swipe to the right to see new videos from all of your favorite channels. And they've got more videos, tens of thousands of videos now unlocked for your phone. Now, if you are still not convinced as a genealogist that you need an app on your smartphone, on your tablet, on your iPad, here are five reasons that you should be using the YouTube app in conjunction with your family history research. Number one, learn more about your ancestors' world. You'd be amazed what you can learn on YouTube. And if you don't have a mobile device, just go to YouTube.com. Search for clubs businesses, events, uh, other items that impacted your ancestors' lives. I think there's um, limitless possibilities here. If you know the name of the company, if you know the name of the event that they were involved in, do a quick search. Now, of course, Google owns YouTube. So all the different Google strategies I've taught you over the years, you can apply that to your YouTube search and really get a hold of the videos that are kind of give you a real look at uh, what things were like back in the day. Number two, find your ancestors in action. Now, ever since the internet came on the scene, genealogists have been searching online, of course, for photographs, uh, or for the distant cousins who might have those photographs of their family. Well, you can apply this strategy to YouTube and video. I'm going to have a link for you in uh, the show notes that will take you to a podcast episode where we talked about a listener that absolutely hit pay dirt (laughs) using this technique. You may remember it. We, uh, I gave the advice of looking for items that uh, might have affected the lives of their ancestors. And this one genealogy blogger went out and did just that. And she found a video back from the 1940s with her grandma and her mom sitting on a float in a parade. And it was a parade that she had heard about, but nobody had photographs of. Sure enough, there was a video on YouTube and you could access things like this right through this app or at youtube.com. Number three, get quick answers to genealogy questions. If you've got a pressing question, you know, let's say how to fix your ancestry tree or how to create a crafty family history gift, Videos on YouTube not only supply answers, but they show you how. So when you find a channel that you like, uh, perhaps a channel that specializes in genealogy, such as Ancestry's channel or the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel, you can click the subscribe button. This is going to set you up to be notified when new videos from that channel are published. And that's awesome. You don't have to keep looking back. It's absolutely free. And it comes to you, those, those new videos. Uh, you can sign in to YouTube with your free Google account because, of course, as I said, Google owns YouTube. Once you're signed in, then you can subscribe and these are, videos are going to come to you. Kind of like a, a Google Alerts of YouTube videos, right? Number four, benefit from genealogy conferences from the comfort of your own home. You know, not everybody has the time or, of course, the money to attend a genealogy conference. And conference organizers understand this, and they really are harnessing the power of online video to bring key content to users where they are. And that's you. So to get started, check out the videos that feature popular conference speakers and the conference experiences from channels like Southern California Genealogical Society. Those are the folks who put on the jamboree each year. And you could just do a search. SCGS Genealogy in the app. And of course, NGS, the National Genealogical Society, search for them at NGS Genealogy. And of course, on my Genealogy Gems YouTube channel, I've got um, a whole playlist of my interviews with experts as I travel the country and the world talking to genealogy experts at the various conferences where I speak. We're getting a lot of those recorded and those are available for you right there on the YouTube channel, just like being there. And number five, learn new techniques for sharing your family history. Get crafty and creative with project ideas that you find on YouTube. And they don't have to just be a genealogy video or channel, but craft items and uh, projects that might be really good for translating family history to your family. Search for keywords like photos, 
shadow boxes, quilting, scrapbooking. You get the idea. Um, I've set up a special playlist on the Genealogy Gems channel. It's called Family History Craft and Display Projects. It's chock full of videos just to get you started. Uh, just search Genealogy Gems in the YouTube app, or I'll have a link in the show notes to take you directly to that playlist. But there's you know, a lot of different ideas out there, and many of them I think would be wonderful for conveying that family history to the rest of your family, those non-genealogists in your life, right? So these are just a few ideas for using YouTube and the new free YouTube app to enhance your family history adventures. How the census will change in the future. Genealogists in search of their family history, of course, have reaped great rewards from census records being digitized and made available on websites like Ancestry.com and, and FamilySearch. Well, in the future, Americans will have an option to respond to a digital enumerator, the Internet. According to CBS News, for the first time, the Census Bureau is giving U.S. households a chance to respond to government surveys over the Internet. It's part of a bid to save costs and boost sagging response rates in a digital age. The article came out December 17th, and it says beginning this week, more than 3.5 million U.S. households that are randomly selected each year to participate in the American Community Survey will be sent letters asking them to respond online. The ACS questionnaire, formerly known as the Census, long form, it asks households for wide-ranging details from education and income to disabilities, language use, and commute times. Interesting to think how this might change records in the future and access to records in the future. Maybe make it a little easier to do search, or will there be more concerns about um, security and privacy? You know, countries such as Canada and South Korea have moved to make the Internet a regular part of their census operations. And in more recent U.S. tests, about 50 percent of households responded when allowed to respond via the Internet. The Census Bureau has also taken more steps to boost digital security, requiring users to enter a randomly generated user ID to enter the survey site. Interesting to uh, consider, and I'd love to know what you think about this. Um, would you respond to doing this on the internet? Let me know. Uh, you can leave a voicemail at 925-272-4021 or drop me a line, genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And I will have a link to this article in the show notes. You know, when I started podcasting back in early 2007, it was still sort of the wild west of podcasting. The medium had only been invented and gone public in 2005. It has been exciting for me to be part of a of kind of a new frontier of sound and to reach people around the world who are interested in genealogy through these little MP3 files, these sound files online. And the podcast has been far reaching. If you haven't heard already, we had an exciting milestone that we reached recently, just a week or two ago. One million downloads. Can you believe that? Since 2007, when we started up the podcast, it's been downloaded a million times. And of course, a big thank you to you, all of you listening. Um, you're a big part of that number. And it's just exciting to see how long it will take to get to 2 million, right? I actually put together a little infographic. Have you seen these? The infographics are kind of a fun way to convey new information. And I created one on uh, why in the world somebody would want to listen to a genealogy podcast. If you belong to a society, if you have friends who are genealogists or enjoy family history, maybe you could send them this uh, link. I'll have it in the show notes for you. And share the infographic, why they should listen to the podcast. And, of course, it's all in celebration of our reaching the 1 million download milestone. Well, you know, back in 1878, Thomas Edison was experiencing the first Wild West of sound when he created the first recording of the human voice with his phonograph invention. Well, today, historians are working diligently to meticulously capture and preserve 
those earliest recordings. And I have a short video in the show notes that uh, demonstrates all this for you. You'll hear from the archivists who are preserving this incredible um, first recording. And it's, it's amazing. In some ways, 1878 doesn't seem that long ago, but uh, things have come a long way. And it's really nice to know that they're putting that much effort into preserving those original recordings. So check it out. That's uh, Thomas Edison's first recordings and how they're being preserved for generations to come. This final gem for you today is search tips for finding tricky names and spellings in Ancestry.com and Google. Now, even the simplest of names can be subject to creative spelling over the centuries, right? In a video recently put out by Ancestry.com, Krista Cowan takes on the challenge saying that misspelled names are a common problem for genealogy researchers, and she's got some answers for you. If you're fairly new to researching your family history, the video provides a great introduction to the evolution of spelling, names, and the sound decks. More advanced genealogists may want to jump in right around the 10-minute mark on this video to quickly tap into Krista Cowan's tips. She's got tips on, of course, wildcard search in Ancestry, the Ancestry filters, which I think are really interesting to see, and also surname translations in search results. She also provides a really helpful tip on resetting Ancestry's filters to the default position. This happens at about 16 and a half minutes into the video. Did you know that when you run a search using Ancestry's filters, and then you want to start a fresh search? One trick she suggested was to click the box that says match all terms exactly, and then uncheck it. And that action will actually clear out all the previous filters. Otherwise, you could have some of the filters lingering in there, altering the search when you really are trying to start fresh with a new search. So that's a great little tip. So again, I'll have that video for you in the show notes. Now, common surnames and surnames that double for common words in the English language, uh, think of the surname Green, they can also wreak havoc, of course, in Google searches. So one way to deal with that problem is to use the minus sign, uh, which is a search operator. In the case of a surname like Green, here's an example of what you might try. Green, family, tree, and then minus ecology. Removing the keyword ecology by subtracting it with the minus sign from your search query steers Google away from that meaning of the word green. And that's really what you have to keep in mind is what does this surname possibly mean in other aspects of life? And then subtracting those meanings out will get you further into great results. Also, try adding the tilde, which is on your keyboard, next to the word genealogy. What that's going to do is create a synonym search for the word genealogy. So, You've got the surname green, you're taking out meanings like ecology, and then you're telling Google and put it in the context of genealogy, family history, family trees, you get the idea. And what happens is all these wonderful family history related websites rise to the top with that surname green. If you are a Genealogy Gems premium member, I've got the video for you, my full length common surname search class. That video is part of premium membership. You'll find it under the premium video tab. Thanks so much for joining me today for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 148. A couple of quick things before I let you go. I wanted to make you aware that uh, if you're a premium member, you may have noticed that uh, last summer when we transitioned over to the new website, the Getting the Scoop on Your Ancestors in Newspapers class went away. I didn't even notice that it, <laughs> it didn't make the transition. So wanted to make you aware that the newspaper class is back up and part of your premium video collection. 
And also for everybody, wanted to let you know, we just added under the video tab at genealogygems.com, Google Earth for genealogy. This is a uh, about a one hour webinar that we did in conjunction with Roots Magic and wanted to make you aware that that is available for free for viewing from the comfort of your own home. That's available to everybody under the video tab. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, you can reach me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And of course, also leave a voicemail at the voicemail line 925-272-4021. And coming up later in January of 2013, I'm heading to Mesa, Arizona for the Family History Expo, hoping to see lots of you um, out there. It's a beautiful time of year to be in Mesa, Arizona. And we'll be doing two days of uh, ongoing genealogy classes. I'll be teaching four classes and look forward to seeing many of you there. And take a second to stop by the uh, seminars tab at the website. I've got a whole list of where I will be uh, in the coming year of 2013. Boy, it has really booked up quick. And I'm going to be all over the country and over in London and up in Canada. So take a look at the schedule and uh, perhaps you can uh, sit in on one of my classes live this year. would love to see you there. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. 